connecting to the server. We have 36 participants, uh, up to 40, 43. That's great. Someone has raised their hand. I'm not sure what we get to do with a raised hand in this format, but I know that we can answer Q and A's. And I'm not, I'm seeing in the chat, Oh. <laughs> well, I've got 12.31, we'll get started. So, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Malcolm Renfrew Colloquium for Tuesday, August 25th, 2020. Uh, my name is Kenton Bird, and for the past 10 years, I have been a co-coordinator of this series, along with uh, Dan Buckvich from the Lionel Hampton School of Music. Uh, this begins the 20th year for the Renfrew Colloquium. It actually began on 9-11-2001, uh, and over the next 12 months, we'll be revisiting some of the highlights of the 20-year history of the program. This is our first experiment using the Zoom webinar format, and I think it will be the last time we do it. We'll go back to a Zoom meeting because it's a little frustrating for me as the moderator and for our presenter uh, to not be able to see the faces of our participants. Uh, but nonetheless, we will be accepting uh, questions via either the chat function or the Q&A. So you'll see those options at the bottom of your screen. And I would encourage you to start submitting questions uh, fairly early on and uh, I'll relay them to our speaker. This is the first of six weeks of programs that are dealing in various ways with the science and social science of the COVID-19 pandemic. Next week at this time, 12.30 p.m. on Tuesday, September 1st, our speaker will be Scott Minnick from uh, the Idaho Inbury Network about the evolution of the plague bacterium, Yersinia pestis. Uh, in following weeks, we'll hear about wastewater surveillance to predict COVID-19, uh, risk of disease and willingness to vaccinate, uh, pandemic pedagogy in the performing arts, and the science behind vaccine development. If you're not currently a subscriber to the Renfrew Colloquium email uh, notices, you can email me uh, kbird at uidaho.edu, and I can send you a link. We've moved to a new mail server uh, that should make notifications uh, a little simpler and allow us to provide more information about uh, each week's presenters. Um, next week, as I mentioned, uh, Scott Minnick uh, speaking about the plague bacterium, um, and uh, I'll say just a little bit about that. Um, the presentation will discuss the history of plague and how recent genomic analyses of Neolithic and Bronze Age skeletal remains trace the evolution of a mild pathogen to one that can cause devastating pandemics. So uh, perhaps a little historical perspective on uh, what we're going through now. Uh, today, we're uh, 
I'm fortunate to hear from Jennifer Johnson Long from the Department of Mathematics and Statistics and the university's new Institute for Modeling, Collaboration, and Innovation. Uh, Jennifer is an associate professor in the Department of Mathematics and Statistical Sciences. Uh, she holds bachelor's degree from the College of William and Mary in chemistry and mathematics, as well as a PhD in mathematics from the California Institute of Technology. And it's appropriate that she is kicking off our fall series of the Renfrew Colloquium uh, because she was chosen last spring as the Malcolm Renfrew Faculty Fellow in the College of Science. She's deeply involved in math education. She chairs the Education Committee of the Association of Women in Mathematics and serves as uh, the, on the Mathematics Advisory Group for TPSC, uh, teaching mathematics to learners of all ages uh, in both formal and informal settings. Uh, today, her topic is COVID-19 in Idaho, modeling for understanding and forecasting. Uh, so um, again, uh, welcome to Jennifer Johnson Lung, and uh, uh, we hope that uh, you will have plenty of questions for her as she goes through her presentation. So thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, Kenton. Uh, thanks for having me. I hope um, you can see my screen and that you can hear me all right. So what we have here on this first introductory slide is a map which is showing the number of active cases per 10,000 people in Idaho just over the course of the epidemic. And you'll see some other figures later on. Um, all of these images, for the most part, that are in this will be available along with contextualizing information um, on our COVID modeling working groups website, which will be in its official home very, very soon. So I'll give you that at the end of the talk. But first, we're going to really begin with what is what is a model anyway? Um, you know, we've all heard a lot about models in the news. And um, may, maybe before 2020, you knew something about models as well. But um, models have become part of the popular lexicon in a way that they weren't really um, prior to this crisis that we've been navigating over the course of this year. So I'll give you some examples. This is the Bohr model of the atom. And what do we notice about it? Maybe the first thing you notice about it is that it's wrong. Um, just a clue, all models are wrong. That's part of what makes them useful. Not all models are useful but models help to simplify and explain. And as we're going along through this, I would um, love if you have other examples of models that you'd like to pop into the Q&A, please feel free to do that. Um, they don't just need to be questions for me, they can also be answers to my questions because I like to ask questions when I give talks. Models can also predict. So one of the great triumphs of modeling in the 20th century has been the improvements in weather forecasting. Um, People in Louisiana right now aren't very happy about getting hit by two hurricanes back to back, but I bet they're glad they know <laughs> that there's two hurricanes back to back instead of just being surprised by the second one. They also help us to integrate information. So what we have here is a, a map of Idaho and you might say, hey, wait, is a map a model? Yes, yes, a map is also a model because a map gives us um, it, there's simplified information. We have, um, we, we don't have everything about Idaho in this picture. So it does simplify the information, but it also shows connections between pieces of the information that we choose to highlight. So when you look at this, there, there's a lot going on here. We have this different shadings of blue, which indicate what proportion of the population in each of these counties is already over 65. Now, we're familiar with that being relevant for COVID-19 because your risk of death if you contract this disease is much higher if you are over 65. And we can see that in our rural counties here in the center of the state, many of which don't have too many active cases, that's what the red dots are here, there is a, there's a, there's a lot of older people. There's a high proportion of older people. 
and the other thing to notice here, and may, maybe you can infer it from the cross hashing of the urban areas where most of the healthcare resources will be, these vast swaths of our rural and frontier regions are not going to have the same hospital and emergency care facilities that our more urban areas that have seen most of our outbreaks so far have. What else can models do? Again, they can simplify and explain. When we communicate right now on Zoom, um, this is an image of how email moves from one computer to another, but it could really be how this talk is moving from, you know, my head to my computer to your screen, right? And, and there's a lot that goes on there, right? There's a lot going on inside each one of these computers, which in this model have been relegated to just a black box. What we're looking at here is the interest is in how, how do things move between these computational devices, right? A couple more. Models don't have to be mathematical or technical at all, right? Models can be representations that allow us to see ourselves in a different way than we could before. They allow us to imagine and create. Um, but sometimes they're also limiting. They help us identify and categorize or stereotype. These are also ways of modeling. And uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this um, unfortunate poster that the math club at BYU put out, uh, did a lot of work to have an event for the girls in their um, math department. And they all invited their favorite professors who happened to all be men. It didn't go over very well on social media. Um, we have an example of a woman right here who's a mathematician, but you know, you also have NFL players who are mathematicians. And you know, we see that these, these models of what a mathematician might look like are not, um, are not right, they're also wrong, but they also might not be very useful. Models also help us to communicate. And this image is very important for communicating the effectiveness of masking. What do we see in this image? Well, for one, we see the unmasked woman who is infected but doesn't know it, right? Um, sometimes we've been using the term silent COVID for that. That is a, a feature of this disease which is quite unfortunate and, and different than a lot of the other respiratory illnesses that circulate. It has a long period of time, rather long, about two, two and a half days, when you can be transmitting the virus before you feel any effects at all, before you haven't, or at least enough effects that you would be aware that you're sick. And depending on your age, that period could be longer. You know, um, I'm, I've certainly had the experience of having a little too much to drink one night, waking up the next morning thinking I was hungover, and then realizing by mid-afternoon, no, I've come down with something. So sometimes we can be sick before we realize it. So when we're sick, I mean, these respiratory, do respiratory droplets come out of us all the time. The problem is that sometimes they have a virus in them. Well, probably they always have a virus in them. Sometimes they have a virus in them for which we do not have fully developed immunity and which can make us very sick. Now, there are different sizes of droplets here. That's very useful. So I have, you know, my sneezes, the, the big things that might, um, that I might feel kind of on the back of my mask when I'm wearing my mask. And, and those will fall down to the ground, much like, you know, a cannonball <laughs> that was shot. You know, Ga Galileo could uh, map those trajectories, right? This is not new mathematics. Um, but some of the smaller particles, they, they hang around longer. Actually, the understanding of this type of motion took longer, right? These, these smaller particles, sometimes we talk about their movements as Brownian motion. And what do I notice when I look down here at the infected person that's masked? There are many, many, many fewer of these respiratory droplets, but there's not zero. So that's very helpful for communicating a lot about the way that masks interrupt, but do not completely eliminate transmission. But where's the math, right? I'm a mathematician. Well, mathematics is a really flexible language. We can use mathematics to construct models, 
we can use mathematics to explore the consequences of our models. But mathematics is not itself a model, at least not, not as I think of it. We'll get into a little bit of philosophy here. Um, in the way that I understand it, mathematics itself does not reflect the world around us. It is not um, constructed out of you know, the hard nature of reality. But it does reflect our own mental architecture and our conceptual capacity. I, I kind of, my conjecture is that if we were to meet a really brilliant alien race, that they would have the same whole numbers that we have, because that's something that's from the world. You know, we can have two rocks sitting on the ground, but that the rest of their math might be completely different. So mathematics comes into this conversation about modeling and pandemic modeling because it provides many tools that are used by modelers, though certainly not all of the tools. So let's talk a little bit about some types of mathematics. Beginning, of course, with number theory, since that is um, my bread and butter and uh, something that is it, useful to see how mathematics um, works with a, a model that we can really get into lots and lots of details about. So what I have here in all sorts of fun notation, those are Peano's axioms for the natural numbers, our whole numbers. And this, is, this small set of mathematical statements is actually enough to completely describe the whole numbers. And beginning with that, we can prove everything that we know and state everything that we don't know. For example, where all of the zeros of this Riemann zeta function are, which is still a million dollar Clay Mathematics Institute prize problem if you are looking for a really hard way to earn a million bucks. Now, we start with these rules, these axioms, and then we deduce and we determine what are the consequences of those rules. What are the consequences of the assumptions that we've made in our model? For disease modeling, graph theory turns out to be really important. And this is because disease transmits from person to person. So if I think of each person as being one of the nodes on this graph and the contact and edge between them, this gives me a really useful way to think about how disease might spread. And you may have seen images like this in the news in the last few months. Dynamical systems is another very important area of mathematics that has lots of applications to modeling and particularly disease modeling, all sorts of modeling really. But um, you know, the, the examples here look like solutions to differential equations, which they are. Um, but we can also think of discrete time and discrete space dynamical systems. Dynamical systems are, we're looking at how how systems evolve over time um, and what solutions to those systems might be stable in some way. Finally, differential equations uh, is probably the most important tool in, in modeling. Uh, and there's a good reason for that. If you look on the left here, we have, if your eyes haven't glazed over because there's mathematical symbols on the slide, then you'll see, you know, just blink them a few times, you'll see it again the FDT here. So what, what does that mean? That means I'm taking the derivative at F with respect to time, or in particular, I'm looking at how does uh, this function change at any given time in an instantaneous way. So I can look at how much it's changed over a period, but the derivative is I'm shrinking that down. How much is it changing right now? Is it increasing quickly? Is it decreasing quickly? Right, we can see that if it's a uh, what a uh, function of one variable, we can see that in terms of its slope. So that's why differential equations are important because we live, we, we experience our, our world, we observe phenomena in time. So because our understanding of time is this linear um, perspective, which uh, I, I will throw out a, a book recommendation here while I'm at it, Carlo Rivali's The Order of Time is fantastic if you want to think about time in some other ways. Um, but, but certainly since, since the advent of the railway and the synchronizing of the clocks, which was where Einstein worked when he discovered the theory of special relativity. And I, um, you know, that's not an accident. Uh, we have understood time in a fairly 
you know, linear and constant way. We think of time as the thing that marches on without change. And so then looking at how everything else changes with respect to that makes a lot of sense to us. And differential equations give us a very natural way to talk about that. In particular, there's one assumption that we have to make in order to use differential equations that is, um, is very important. So for those of you who have had calculus, you know that if you want to be able to take a derivative, you need your function to be continuous. And more than continuous, right? It needs to, it needs to not have any weird bumpy parts, no edges, no corners. Well, that's a big assumption. The real world is not always like that. In fact, you know, if you drill down close enough, the real world is never like that. There's nothing that we know of that is truly continuous. I mean, the real numbers are actually one of the most pathological mathematical objects that's out there. So we'll see a little bit later what the consequences of that are. But first, let's drill into an example of applying differential equations to understand um, disease spread. So what I'm presenting to you now, we're still in the math section here. So this is a purely mathematical model of, of, of a town, a small college town. And we've broken out four populations. We have our students, we have our towns, we have our faculty, and our superhero staff who keep us all together and working. Well, this group interacts, and we'll consider each of these groups separately as they progress through these compartments. So every staff member, if you want to think of it this way, or the entire uh, group of staff members are each going to be assigned to one of these compartments, and so on. So for each of these groups, that, that's, they'll be moving through these compartments. Everyone starts out as susceptible, and then they can move through exposed, infected, as we go. Now, each of these arrows is a rate. So the change in susceptibles, that as people move from susceptibles to exposed, is going to be given by this. So the, as people leave success susceptibles and go into exposed in a time-dependent way, we're going to be giving it by this rate. Uh, similarly, as they move from the group of exposed individuals into the group of infected individuals, there's a rate that's given, and so on. So there's all sorts of Greek letters floating around here. Each Greek letter you should think of as a disease parameter. It's something that, well, some of the other ones might be too, but it's something that depends on, on the way that disease interacts with our bodies. And these were all completely unknown when we first began to study COVID-19, um, you know, at least as collectively, as a, as a globe, really. But over the course of the last several months, you know, there was fantastic data that came out of Wuhan that was able to give a, a lot of very good estimates, um, partly because there's not great privacy in some of those countries, so you get very uh, clear studies. Um, you get a lot of information about the patients. So these parameters below the yellow box are all fairly well estimated. The difficulty in understanding how these models are going to progress is really in this set right up here. So let me talk for a minute about what these are. Beta i is called sometimes the force of infection, and that has to do with how much the infection wants to move from me to you. So that has to do with things like if it can be transmitted through aerosols, but it also has to do with, you know, does the society universally mask when they're outside of their homes, for example. That's going to affect that beta. On the other hand, these MIJs here, these correspond to these arrows, right? They're saying how much are the, these students mixing with the staff? Because if a student is going to be able to pass it to a staff member, it doesn't, they have to come near them. They have to be interacting with them. So these mixing uh, factors here are, are very important for determining the disease progression. So we have the output from this model, and again, this is not fitted to, to any data. The COVID-19 parameters are in there. Um, you know, we have some population sizes, but we have not, uh, th this is a, a pure mathematical model. 
Uh, what do we learn from this? Well, we learn what the effects of different mixing regimes are. So if I go down through this list I, uh, of possible scenarios, I've essentially made two binary switches. Either we have in-person classes or we don't. And either the bars are open or they're not. So if you go back to this model, there's no bars in this model. There's no classrooms in this model. What the heck is she talking about? Well, the way that we try to understand this in our model is that in-person classes mean a high mixing rate between faculty and students. And it, we estimated it approximately what you would expect to be in our normal life, right? These, these estimates of in-person classes and bars open are, are the rates of normal mixing if, if everything was fine. Similarly, for bars open, what did, how do we think about that? Well, it meant the students interacted with each other more, more students interacting with more students. We kind of modeled that as students going out, but also students interacting with comparable aged people in the town. So increasing interactions between students in town and increasing interactions between, among themselves. So what are the consequences of that? Well, when you don't do anything, the students have a lot of infection. The faculty are close behind. You look over on the y-axis, this is the proportion of each population that is infected at any given time. So there are many fewer faculty than students, but by looking at this as a proportion of the population, I'm able to compare the curves and kind of understand the impact on each group. Similarly, if I go over here where there's everything shut down, there's no in-person classes and all the bars are closed. And really we're sort of assuming there's no parties either, right? Because parties would mean mixing. Um, then the infection stays fairly well under control. And then there's things in between, right? So when there's no in-person classes, but the bars are open, you see that the uh, effect on faculty has changed dramatically. Faculty and staff are now basically the same but the effect on um, the town is basically unchanged. So if I'm the mayor, I don't probably care one way or the other if the university is having in-person classes if all of the students are in town and the bars are open because it's basically gonna be the same for the town. Um, and maybe the intervention from the town perspective is to try to reduce transmission in social settings, right? I'm certainly not trying to advocate here that we need to close all bars in Moscow, so I don't know who all is on the call, but I'm, I'm not trying to say that. This is really a proxy for mixing. That's what I'm hoping that everyone is getting out of this, is that these contact rates are the key to understanding how, how the epidemic will spread. Right? It's how groups of people interact. All right, so now let's talk about data. Um, I'm just gonna check on, okay. So I said before that mathematics isn't, doesn't tell us what the real world is. Mathematics just is very good at telling us what the consequences are of the rules that we set up for the world that we want the mathematics to tell us about. Well, data, they're our probe that we stick out in the real world to try to find out what's going on. You know, we use our eyes so much. I think it's, it's useful to think about walking into a room blindfolded and then looking around and trying to figure out, hey, what am I, um, what am I touching? What am I running into? You, you have other ways of getting data about your surroundings that aren't necessarily the ones that you usually use. And that will help to, um, to give you an idea of what room you're standing in and what hazards or useful things might be in there for you. So let's just have a look at some features of the data that we're getting on the coronavirus in Idaho. Um, this is all of these plots that have this like blue bars here are off the COVID-19 tableau that's kept by the um, Idaho Department of Health and Welfare. It's got a lot of really inf useful information. If you haven't checked it out before, um, you can get into it by going to coronavirus.idaho.gov. And I want to point out a couple of things. First of all, 
this little first increase in cases from our, our March outbreak um, that started in Blaine County has a, has a similar but shorter shape than this one, okay? Cases stayed remarkably flat for quite a long time. We've seen that um, these periods of flatness th throughout a country actually, which have been kind of interesting where many people are trying to uh, understand what the different um, reasons are for that. And then you notice, hey, wait a second, all the cases are trailing off here at the end. And maybe your first instinct is to say, whoa, that's great, it's going away. Um, my own advice would be whenever you're getting the conclusion that you were hoping you would get, it's a good time to check and make sure that you haven't made a mistake because we do have this bias to want to confirm our own assumptions. But what we notice here actually is that this is COVID-19 by date of onset. So the reason we don't have any cases, say to you know, yesterday or almost no cases yesterday is because this is based on the date that the person either first started exhibiting symptoms or was tested. So people are, if someone went in and got tested on August the 13th, but they had started feeling sick on August the 6th, then their, um, their positive test might not come back till August the 16th, 20th. It's um, been not as fast of a turnaround as we would like right now, but it eventually will come back and then it will go back and get put on August the 6th. Okay, so COVID-19 by date of onset is very useful for giving us an idea of where the infections are, but it's important to be aware of what's not going to be in that data. We also have our hospitalization data. So let's just look at a couple of features of this. One important thing to notice about hospitalizations is that increases in hospitalizations always lag increases in cases. So why? Well, one, fewer people are going to be hospitalized. So if you only have one case, the probability that that's going to need to be a hospitalized case is going to be smaller, right? So you might have to have several cases before you end up with a hospitalized case. Of course, maybe not. It could be that that first case is the hospitalized case. This is one of the issues that I was talking about earlier with using differential equations as our modeling tool because, you know, 0.2 hospitalizations doesn't really make any sense. Either a person is hospitalized or they're not. This phenomenon of probability manifesting itself in seemingly random fashion in small and discrete sets is known as stochasticity. All right, so what we see then as well, and maybe I said this already, but I'll say it again because it's really important, is that the increase in hospitalizations lags the increase in cases. So we would expect that um, by the time we see interesting, you know, a real, real push in rising of our hospitalized numbers, if the cases have already gone up a lot, there's nothing we can do right this second to slow down the burden on the hospital system. If we want to slow down that burden on the hospital system, we have to change our behavior before the hospital system becomes overloaded. All right, so I said that we can probe with data to find out a little bit about what's going on, but all we're getting is cases, right? We're getting some detected cases, people who felt sick enough to go in, people who were allowed to get a test, people who could afford to get a test, right? We're not seeing all of the infections. And that's the information we'd really like to have is what are the infections? How many infections do we have? Well, that's where we use estimates. All right, so we, there are a lot of statistical tools in modeling and I, I am not a statistician, so I will not really be speaking about um, the importance of the statistical tools here, except just to say that, that they do matter. Um, but we're making, whenever you take data and then make inferences about what you think is happening in the real world, that's using statistics. That's not mathematics, right? Statistics is really the science of numbers. So what we have here is an estimated frequency in Idaho of, of silent COVID, of people who are transmitting the virus 
and walking around and don't look sick. And um, that was a time series of how that has changed over the last um, months of this epidemic. Now, just this is the, what we're estimating. And now let's talk about assumptions. Because whenever we make inferences and when we build our models, we have to make some assumptions. So they've, we've assumed here that 10% of the infections are detected as cases. Um, there's a good reason for that because um, the, there's estimates that about 10% of infections, people get sick enough to want to go to the doctor. So that's where that 10% comes from. Um, these infections are considered active or, or transmitting for about 10 days. So that's one of those disease estimates that we have because we've had so many studies on how the disease has progressed around the world. And we have a pretty good idea. I mean, granted, there's a big spread there. It's not like every person, they get the disease, 10 days, they're done and perfectly healthy, right? Um, if you follow the news on COVID at all, you know that already. Um, we've assumed that 57.8% are symptomatic. 35.8% are infectious. Um, for, you know, 2.3 out of 10 days, they're infectious before they feel symptoms, right? That's, that's that, that pre-symptomatic period and so on. So most of these, these assumptions are, are not just assumptions that we're making. They're based on published peer-reviewed estimates of parameters. But this number of infections that are actually detected as cases that's a number that is a big assumption, and it matters a lot here. This estimate is very sensitive to the size of that. You know, if, if we assume that only 5% of infections are detected as cases, then this frequency is going to be much higher. Or if we assume that 20% of infections are detected as cases, it's going to be much lower. Um, you know, by testing all of the students as they come onto campus, we hopefully have detected a very high percentage of the infections, initial infections at least, in our, in our campus population. You know, so it might be more like 80 or 90 percent. Um, it's not going to be quite as high as the, um, well, as it, it's, maybe I should say, the, the, the infections that are not detected, right, so people are infectious, they went and got their test, it said negative, those are our false negatives. And I don't have time in this talk to drill down into um, conditional probability, but uh, there will be, we, we have a journal on our, on our website and um, that's my next post is actually on false positives and false negatives and how to think about conditional probability a little bit. So there's an opportunity for you to continue to learn more than I can tell you in, in this talk. Right, so how do we get that estimate? How do we know if that's the right, um, if 10% is the right number? You know, if uh, there's a whole lot of cases early on in the epidemic, it was very difficult to get tested, right? Um, other times we have things like what's happening in, on our campus where, where we surveillance test. We test all sorts of people, people who don't seem sick at all and haven't been exposed at all. Um, and, and there's that kind of heterogeneity in testing throughout um, the, this, the country, the state, the country, probably just, you know, the world, really. So where, how do we trust a data stream like cases? I mean, the answer is really that we don't entirely trust cases as a data stream. And our model and um, other models are fitted off of hospitalization data. So we looked at this hospitalization curve a little bit earlier, and here it is again. And the reason that hospitalization or data are best is because how sick you have to be to be admitted and put in a hospital bed is pretty much the same throughout the course of an epidemic unless the hospital system becomes over overloaded. And then, then that data becomes also harder to trust. At the same time, hospitalization data is challenging because it doesn't come through very quickly. Hospitals are more concerned with treating their patients than they are with um, giving data to modelers. And they, they do have to give data to the federal government, but even the rules for that have changed and the data streams have been very slow to catch up. So it's been a challenge for modelers throughout the country um, to get really consistent, good 
data on hospitalizations. Um, we also have an interesting curve here, which is the number of patients that require intensive care. So notice that the bars in both of these plots are about the same size, but the axes are different, right? The hospitalizations are about factor four bigger than the intensive care um, hospitalizations. And we see that that's actually not changed, right? These bars are about the same size. So while we have seen improvements in therapeutics, and we'll see that in our death curves in a minute, um, we haven't really done a, we haven't really gotten therapeutics at the lower level, right? That, that reduce the probability that hospitalized people will need to go into intensive care. We can, um, we do have improved standards of care where if you're in intensive care, you're less likely to die now, which is fantastic. But um, it's not, it's not necessarily as great as we, we we're not where we would like to be yet. So we also then can look at death as a lagging data stream. So there's a question about antibodies. Um, would antibody tests help in showing the actual percentage of people getting hospitalized? Are our normal tests good enough? So antibodies are an interesting um, problem to think about because there, there's multiple types of antibodies and um, maybe Tanya Mira when she speaks a little later in the term, we'll, we'll address some of this, but um, your antibody levels don't just go up and then stay up after you're exposed. You have different antibodies that go up and down, and um, by some finite period, even if you still would produce antibodies if exposed to the virus, you might not be just walking around where people can detect them in your blood. So I don't think that it, that antibody testing would help with, with understanding the hospitalization rates. So death, you can see, lags well behind cases. You can really see it here with our fallout, with our spring outbreak, right? We had cases going back to February, but deaths didn't start showing up until late March. So death is a very lagging data stream and it's also less reliable than hospitalization because deaths may or may not be uh, attributed to COVID-19 when they are COVID-19 deaths. You also see, so a couple of things. One, we compared the sizes of bars before, and you can see that the ratio of the heights of these death, these num counts of deaths to counts of cases, um, it's gotten smaller. So that's, that's good. Actually, our standards of care are improving. And you also see here the stochastic effects I was talking about earlier in the lags between the deaths, right? It can't ever get lower than one death. Death is a discrete thing. You, you don't have half a person die. So there are limits on, on what differential equations can tell us, but we do have tools for understanding those limits and working around them. Mathematics, if nothing else, is remarkably flexible. All right, so let's look at our Idaho State forecasting model. We have, we, we, remember we had that little cartoon model before where we had four different groups of people in one little tiny college town. Now we have everyone in Idaho, and, then, and we've broken them out by where they live. So 50 cities with a travel network between them. And in each of those cities, we have five different age groups that we consider separately because the disease does impact people differently depending on their age. And you can see that there's a lot more compartments for people to move through here. Um, and I'm not gonna go into the details of this model, but I'll just say that every model is made for, to answer certain questions, right? You don't just make a, a model just without having um, some purpose in mind. So, here, we are, we're thinking about early on in this epidemic, when are we going to overrun our healthcare system? When are we going to run out of ICU beds? When are we going to run out of ventilators? Those were the questions that were on the forefront of all decision makers' minds in February, March, and April. So I have another question. Um, so why, why do we say that people who test positive but have no symptoms, why do we call them asymptomatic instead of saying that they're immune? 
Well, because they're, so for them to be immune, then they would not also be transmitting the virus, okay? So if they were immune, I, then the, they would get the virus and their immune system would shut down the replication of the virus and they wouldn't be able to get other people sick. So people who can still get other people sick are vectors and they are commit, contributing to the epidemic spread. Um, so when we're talking about immunity, you know, if you, you want people that when the virus comes and attacks them, it doesn't go anywhere else. They're an endpoint. Hope that answered that question. All right. And here's a most recent forecast from this forecasting model. So there's a, a few things that I want to show you about it. And I need to speed up a little bit. But I, I want to say, first of all, this thing has two peaks. Because Idaho had two peaks. But none of those other things had two peaks, right? All of those curves look the same. It was like the little hill, up and down, up and down. Maybe it was like longer to come back down. But they all look the same. Why does this look different? Because that beta that I referred to earlier, that force of infection that can change depending on our behavior, we allowed that to be a time-dependent parameter. And we're able to fit it to um, you know, some mobility measures that we have. So, so in order, this, this was fit to these black dots, which are data that we got from the, directly from the Department of Health and Welfare. And you can see that it does a good job of predicting um, the hospitalization curves, these gray bars that are from the tableau. Now, one other thing that I want to point out, okay, so this last tableau bar ended in July, and you can see that the peak here should be right about now, which is interesting. I, I don't think that we are quite at our peak of hospitalizations, but I think that we are, you know, we've just come past our peak of cases. Now, the shape of the curves, if you remember the curves that I showed you before, they don't quite look like this. They're flatter. And we have some thinking, people are thinking about what, why that is. And I think the main, and to my mind, the main reason is to, is that our behavior changes, right? When we see these hospitalizations going up around us, we take more precautions or many of us do, and enough of us do, to change the trajectory of the epidemic. So that was what I answered there, is how we understand the difference between the forecast and the data. So what does this mean for us as individuals? And the way that we behave can have such a strong effect collectively on the progress of an epidemic. How do we make decisions about our lives? Um, this is a framework that's been very helpful for me and that I've communicated with other people about, um, that it's useful to think in terms of harm reduction. As you can see here, this is the confirmed cases in Lataw County. The slope of these cases, there's some little flat dots here, but that happens every weekend. And then the slope in between those little weekend dots has been getting steeper and steeper, right? We are not in a situation where there's no risk we are likely to have further cases in our community. We have been very lucky so far to not have deaths in our community, but I don't know how long that we'll be that lucky. You know, we saw those stochastic effects. If we build up enough cases, then you stop getting the gaps, right? Um, so how do we make decisions? We can think in terms of what we actually need to do. So a needful risk should reduce some other harm or meet an essential need, like grocery shopping or taking care of someone who needs help or you know, getting your tuition paid so you can go to class and graduate. Um, needless risks increase potential harm without having this benefit of meeting some need. So our goal is to meet all of our needs and the needs of those around us without needless risk. Our actions are the biggest factor in determining the course of our local ac epidemic at this point. Um, our leaders are unlikely to make, in this state at least, big significant policy hammers. Um, and so it's really up to us. And this last little graph here are some trajectories about what we might expect on campus. 
under different transmission regimes. So these are in terms of R0, which is closely related to beta, but you can see if we keep that force of infection low, then the case counts are a lot lower, or these are really in infection numbers are a lot lower than if we don't. And there, there's a huge difference between the left-hand set of trajectories here and the right-hand set of trajectories. So um, I just want to say thank you to Malcolm Renfrew. This is a picture Kenton told me from his 100th birthday. Um, and to all the people who helped me with images for this talk. Um, I'm using my fellowship money to fund undergraduate research fellowships in um, pandemic modeling. So if you would like to get involved with that, you can email me. If you can't get this off the slide, you can just look it up on the math department website. And our group's website will be here very soon. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer, for an informative and um, some ways uh, a stimulating and other ways frightening presentation. Um, we, I'll give you a, just a few seconds to catch your breath, but we have a couple questions that came in uh, through the chat function. And uh, Patrick is asking, uh, approximately um, one month ago, the way that the test and hospitalization data is collected changed from um, CDC to HHS, from Centers for D Disease Control to Health and Human Services. Uh, have you been able to see, in quotes, any changes that can be related to differential reporting? Yes, and we're actually in the process of trying to change the data stream that we use to fit because of that. Um, you know, the, we were getting uh, line lists from the Department of Health and Welfare, um, and those have, be, when they get us stuff, it's even later than it was, right? Um, the, the lag in data coming from those channels for hospitalization are the, the detailed line lists about patients with ages and everything are, um, are becoming, uh, we're getting them so late, they're not particularly useful for forecasting, I think is how I would say that. I mean, they're still useful for retrospectively understanding what's happened. But if, if you wanna know how bad is it gonna be here in three weeks, that data is not, <laughs> is not helpful. Um, so we're working on um, trying to move over to maybe the Tableau data to use then. Uh, a question from Michael who asks, are there general equations you can use to model equations um, just by putting in um, specific details about this disease or are the models completely unique? Um, and uh, he makes a comparison of uh, coronavirus to diseases like polio. Uh, would you uh, use the same equations and different constants or factors or if, completely different? So uh, a couple of things. One, if, um, you know, if, if, if Ben is on, then he should post an answer to this in the Q&A. Um, because he is a much more experienced disease modeler than I am and has modeled many different diseases, whereas I, um, being a number theorist, have learned everything that I know about epidemiological modeling in the last five months. And I'm very grateful to my <laughs> training as a Caltech scientist for being able to do that. Um, so roughly speaking, you can model any sort of contagion with some sort of SEIR model, right? I could model social contagion that way. I could model um, addiction, you know, in, in some ways that way, right? Um, I guess thinking of addiction as a social contagion. Um, but it, realistically, the, it looks pretty different um, when you consider mixing, right? If I think about HIV, for example, the type of contact that I need to have with an individual um, in order for them to give me HIV is very different than the type of contact that I need to have with an individual in order for them to transmit coronavirus to me. And so the most useful models for thinking of HIV are gonna be different than the most useful models for thinking about coronavirus. So um, I, I'm not sure if that answers your your question, it's not, it's not completely different, right? An SEIR model is gonna have some of the same features in any disease framework, and it's mostly the parameters that will change. But you might find for some diseases, it's more helpful to use, say, a network model. Um, you have also seen a lot of statistical models in, uh, in the news that um, I didn't even talk about at all. And, and those are more based on, when populations are large, um, disease spread between people 
behaves more, it's more about physics than it is about um, biology. Jennifer, we have a question about uh, undergraduate research. And so maybe that's a good opportunity to uh, talk about the Institute for Modeling Collaboration and Innovation and um, talk about your soon to be live website and the blog. Yeah, so um, we have, I have a few ideas for projects. Some of our other colleagues probably also have ways that they would like to um, bring undergraduates into into this work. Um, for one, uh, I hope you've noticed from this talk that what I think is really important right now is communicating clearly um, some of these more complex mathematical ideas and making them relevant to people's lives because what people do matters. So I am looking for someone that would be interested in, um, in helping as an editor um, for our journal and, and with, with that kind of work. So that's someone that doesn't necessarily know how to, how to code. Um, but for people who know how to code, we have a couple of different sizes and, and types of agent-based models that um, we're, we're building now that we, I didn't talk about at all. So we have several other projects that are in the works. Um, we have a, a survey that will be um, sent out to rural populations um, in several states across the country. We just got funded um, by the NIH as a supplement to the big IMCI grant that was um, announced last week. So uh, we have a lot going on. Um, we meet every week. If you're interested, um, you should come to one of our meetings and talk to people and let us know what, what skills you have and um, what you're interested in learning about. Because it's, it's, uh, it's work and you'll have to work really hard, but you'll learn a lot and um, get a chance to work with some really great people. I've been very happy um, in this time of isolation to have colleagues that I enjoy collaborating with, so. We have about uh, five minutes left. If there are uh, any uh, other questions about uh, modeling in, in general or um, COVID-19 in Idaho in, in particular, we'd uh, uh, love to hear them before wrapping up. Um, here's another one from uh, Patrick uh, asking, uh, have your Moscow data been shared with the University of Idaho administration or uh, is there a, a way so that the this is... trajectories that you saw at the very end um, are just a little piece of an internal agent based model for just the campus. So the, the toy model that I showed of a generic college town, I mean, certainly is based on the size of Moscow, but it's not fitted to any of our actual data, it, while it, it does use COVID, um, actual, you know, COVID parameters. Um, but, but yes, the, the group is, um, is working, and Ben in particular has been working his butt off to try to help guide the administration in their decision making. And, and how about with the uh, um, North Central um, Health District uh, here, Public Health Idaho, are they? Yes, yeah, so we have, um, so we have sent forecasts uh, to the state level Department of Health and Welfare and we have collaborated a little bit and um, we gave feedback to the public health district on their um, their sort of plan I forget what they called it but they had like a colored levels that they were, they had were having feedback on so we gave them some feedback on that recently about what those thresholds should be um, for people to take more precautions um, I, I know that Whitman County has one that's published they just went to red after this past weekend um, I think we've covered everything in the, uh, the chat and the, the Q&A um, to uh, various uh, degrees. Um, and uh, I, I think this is uh, appropriate for, uh, if you'd like to give a, a virtual round of applause to our, our speaker at this point and encourage you to uh, contact her for uh, additional information. Um, again, if you're not on the Renfrew Colloquium email subscription list. Uh, you can write to me, kbird at uidaho.edu. Uh, we hope you will join us uh, next Tuesday, 1230, uh, with uh, Scott Minnick uh, talking about the plague uh, and uh, perhaps what we can uh, learn from it that might be applicable to the current situation. So 
Uh, again, thank you, to Jennifer. Thanks to our uh, audience and uh, hope to see you again next week. Yeah, thanks for having me, Kevin. Yeah. Goodbye. Bye-bye.